What if a gun had a soul? This was the pitch from director Brad Bird that inspired the classic 90s cinematic masterpiece, The Iron Giant. One of Western cinema's last and greatest truly hand-animated films. Its style is distinct, mirroring the shifting tone of 1950s Americana, an explosive mixture of pre-World War II innocence and post-World War II paranoia. This thing. You are going to lead me to it, and we are going to destroy it before it destroys us! Its characters are layered, depicted with detail and nuance in their expressions. Oh, Hogarth. The tone and pacing effortlessly shift from intriguing to dramatic. To hilarious. In front of us and stop! The, uh, the devil! To poignant. It's part of life. It's bad to kill. But it's not bad to die. It deftly handles complex themes like violence, grief, and loss, while still remaining accessible to anyone. It masterfully utilizes animation to evoke emotion from the viewer, churning with a deeply heartfelt soul underneath it all. Pulling from his own experience, Brad Bird crafted this masterpiece with a core philosophy that transcends its humble origins. Our troubles are open. Hi, I'm Tim, and welcome to my thoughts. The story is set in the quaint, fictional seaside town of Rockwell, Maine. The looming threat of communism conjures a sense of paranoia that permeates the air. One night, a strange invader plummets into the ocean just off the coast, sending quiet yet urgent alarm bells ringing in the halls of the United States government. Nine-year-old Hogarth is energetic, goofy, and maybe just a little too smart for his age. One fateful night, an inexplicably missing TV antenna prompts him to investigate the nearby woods. He discovers a colossal metal man, electrocuted by the high voltage lines of a power plant. With some quick thinking, Hogarth manages to save the giant, unknowingly beginning a friendship that would change his life forever. A noticeable bump on his head, the giant awakes in a state akin to Locke's tabula rasa, a blank slate. He has no notion of who he is, where he comes from, or what his purpose is, retaining the innocence and intellect of a small child. It's now up to Hogarth to teach the giant the ways of the world and all that it entails. I am now the luckiest kid in America! Now let's take a step back and unwind the story of how this film came to be. It all starts with Brad Bird. A lifelong filmmaker, Bird has written for Spielberg, executive consulted on The Simpsons, and directed mega-hits like The Incredibles, Ratatouille, and Mission Impossible. But before grossing billions in the box office, he still had something to prove. The year was 1996. Warner Brothers attained Bird's contract through their acquisition of Turner, and gave him pick of then-in-production projects. He was drawn to a musical based on the 1968 sci-fi novel The Iron Man by Ted Hughes. Hughes penned the book as a way to help his children cope with the grief of losing their mother at a young age. Bird found relatable solace in this, particularly its portrayal of life and death as he struggled deeply with the loss of his own beloved sister due to gun violence a few years prior. He restructured the entire concept, ditching the idea of a musical altogether. Instead, drawing upon his own experience, he pitched the idea, what if a gun had a soul? Execs greenlit the concept and handed Bird the keys to direct. With just half the time and budget of similar Disney films, Bird and his team pioneered creative solutions that would reverberate through the industry for years to come. Things like transforming rough cut storyboards into fully directed reels using After Effects, 
custom designing programs to seamlessly blend the 3D model giant into 2D environments, and the emergence of town hall style gatherings where Bird openly critiqued each animator's work, a practice unheard of at the time, yet it proved indispensable, inspiring, rallying, and unifying staff behind a common direction. These are but a few examples of how Bird and his scrappy, understaffed team managed to complete the grueling workload of animating a feature-length film. Writing high, everyone was thrilled about the film's imminent release, excited to share their work with the world. Really fine work, terrific animation, and just to put it in context, Tarzan started a year before us, and they'll be finished with animation in three weeks. With, with 40 more animators. So, they're p***ings! Unfortunately, due to the financial flop of WB's quest for Camelot, executive interest in animation evaporated overnight. Sadly, this resulted in The Iron Giant receiving a lackluster, half-hearted attempt at four short months of marketing. The film's box office grossed just half of its overall budget and exited most theaters within weeks. Bird and his staff were heartbroken. A hundred foot robot? <laughs> That's nutty. <laughs> what else did he say? Throughout the film, Hogarth and the giant attempt to navigate the murky waters of Cold War era paranoia. Hogarth befriends Dean, local artist, beatnik, and junkyard dealer. A fan of jazz and Kerouac, he creates art from scrap and looks real cool in sunglasses. More importantly, he is optimistically open-minded, acting as a positive role model and father figure to Hogarth. And I go, no, I'm stimulated enough right now. That's for sure. So she goes, uh -uh. You really are crazy. I mean, who in the hell would the government send? Directly opposed to Dean, in more ways than one, Kent Mansley, United States government, is Kent Mansley, a borderline hysterical, physical and mental caricature of a cutthroat, egotistical government agent. Mansley is called to investigate Rockwell's strange happenings. On a mission to make a name for himself, he shows no qualms in utilizing every ounce of his power to track down and destroy the giant. Where are you going? Where are you going? I'm going out! Attempting to broaden the giant's horizons, Hogarth uses comics to teach the importance of virtue. He only uses his powers for good, never for evil. And to eschew the evil, destructive tendencies of villains like Atomo. He's not the hero, he's the villain. He's not like you. You're a good guy, like Superman. Meanwhile, Mansley gets ever closer to discovering the giant's whereabouts, while Dean drops some knowledge of his own. Who cares what these creeps think, you know? They don't decide who you are, you do. You are who you choose to be. Just as it seems they're finally getting a handle on things, the giant encounters a deer in the forest, prompting some imperative moral quandaries. It's dead, understand? They shot it with that gun. You don't even know where he is. What the hell? What the hell? He is. Hey, what's wrong? Gun. Yes. Guns kill. Guns kill. All throughout the film, we learn and grow alongside the giant. He discovers emotion, desire, humor, and grief. Remarkably, nine-year-old Hogarth is an excellent friend to this gigantic metal man and an even better teacher. You're made of metal. But you have feelings, and you think about things, and that means you have a soul. And souls don't die. Soul? Mom says it's something inside of all good things, and that it goes on forever and ever.
If you've never seen The Iron Giant, now would be a great time to pause this video and go watch it. Don't say I didn't warn you. No, wait! It's me! Walmart, remember? It's bad to kill. Guns, kill. And you don't have to be a gun. You are what you choose to be. You choose. Choose. Cutting to the film's climax, after the giant's latent, destructive force is unleashed, critical levels of fear and paranoia finally boil over into pure insanity. Mansley bypasses the general and orders an atomic strike. Watch the missile now! Faced with the imminent destruction of all that he loves, the giant understands. He is the only one who can stop the mob. In this moment, we glimpse not just the soul of the giant, but that of the entire creative, passionate team that cultivated this moving masterpiece. I mentioned earlier that Brad Bird's pitch for the film was, what if a gun had a soul? But the full quote goes, what if a gun had a soul and chose not to be a gun? The loss of Bird's sister was a devastating tragedy, one that eventually inspired him to transform his grief into a powerful message that would go on to positively impact the lives of millions. The Iron Giant was a machine designed to destroy, yet by chance ended up with a soul. More than a heartfelt metal friend, he is a symbol. He represents choice the ability we all have to overcome the destructive force inside of us and instead to choose what we do, who we are. Inside of us lies a dichotomous propensity for greatness, whether in destruction or creation, villain or hero, Atomo or Superman. His choice is clear. Be not the one who kills, but the one who saves. You stay. I go. The Iron Giant's sacrifice teaches us that even in the face of the greatest adversity, no following. Even when all seems lost, what you do, who you are, is up to you. Love you. You are who you choose to be. Superman. I'm Tim, and these are my thoughts. If you haven't yet seen this heartfelt animated classic, I would urge you to watch it. While its reach has steadily grown over time, it still has so much to share with those who have not yet experienced it. And if you enjoyed this video, consider watching some of my other videos on my favorite works of cinema. Also be sure to stop by the Discord for more Tim thoughts like these. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.